Welcome to another video by Flat Earth Trads. Please subscribe, like and share it. To continue what I talked about last time, and I talked about original sin in our first parents last time. So the subject of this little talk is original sin in us, in the, the children of Adam. And what it is, first of all, is existence. Secondly, what it is, and thirdly, how we get it, how we receive it. First of all, the existence of original sin, and the existence of original sin is a doctrine of our faith, as you know, De Fide, defined doctrine of faith, and it's defined in the Council of Trent. The Council of Trent has five canons on the subject of original sin and they define that matter which of course was disputed by the protestants and it defines as being of faith that the sin of adam is transmitted to his posterity to his children and it is transmitted by propagation <coughs> and um, not by imitation we find that in uh, Canon 2. If anyone asserts that the transgression of Adam has harmed him alone and not his posterity, and the sanctity and justice received God which he lost, he lost for himself alone and not for us also, let him be anathema. And so, of course, that produces a problem. How can one person lose sanctity and grace for another? So that's the whole problem of original sin try and explain what it is but first of all its existence there's no doubt about it that Adam transmitted to all of us his loss of sanctifying grace his loss of original justice he lost that state of perfection he did not just transmit to us mortality the fact that we would have to die he did not just transmit to us the fact that we would suffer, that he did, but more than that, he transmitted to us the actual disorder that he himself incurred willingly, privation of justice, privation of grace. And that's why we say that Adam transmitted to us not just the punishments of sin, but even the guilt of sin. And we have to understand what that means when we explain that. What do we mean by the guilt of sin? But certainly, he transmitted to us the death of our soul, and that's what we mean by original sin. Let's take a look at some contrary errors, some of the opposing heresies in the, that have taken place over history, and then see how this doctrine of original sin is founded in sacred scripture. All of the errors against original sin are attempts to explain in a different way than what the church does one fundamental observation. And there is a fundamental observation that every intelligent man, every thinking man, can see. And that's the disorder that exists in the created world. That is the fact there is evil in the world. That the fact there is moral evil, there is sin, as well as being suffering and physical evil. That the, the fact that the creation is at odds with the creator, and there is not the order which is all pure, good, and holy and perfect that any man can see. The disorder that exists is, as Cardinal Newman said, something which is as truth as certain as the existence of God himself. And just as we can prove the existence of God by the power of our reason, so we can prove the disorder that exists in the creation. And that disorder is present because of sickness, disease, death, but especially the moral disorder that we observe. 
And so all the errors with respect to original sin are going to be finding other ways of explaining that. We have to arrive at the last century and a half of naturalism to find anybody who's so blind as to, de to deny that fact, as to deny the existence of this disorder. There are people who do it now, of course, but that's something new in the history of humanity, that anybody would have denied the disorder that exists in our human nature and which is the fundamental observation of our, of our sinfulness and the disorder that man creates, the wars, the conflict, the misunderstandings, the hardship, all of which are man's creation, not God's. There is a disorder. That's not a dogma of faith. It's an observation most obvious to the senses. How is it explained? The uh, first error in this regard came from the Gnostics and Manichaeans. And the Gnostics and Manichaeans pretended that the disorder that we see with Uranus is due directly to a god of evil, a demiurge, they call that, a principle of evil. There, it's, it's not man who's responsible. It's not sin. It's just this evil God who, who controls the earth along with the good God. And of course, that denies the absolute sovereignty and perfection of God who is the one creator of the whole universe. There's another error which is a lot more relevant to us because it was not an error from outside the church, from with, but from within the church in the era of Pelagianism. You know, the Pelagians were the great enemies of St. Augustine at the beginning of the 5th century. Pelagians, the Pelagians denied the necessity of grace. And why did they deny the necessity of grace for us to do good? Because they denied effectively original sin. But they didn't deny it in its totality. They didn't deny the disorder. <coughs> what the Pelagians said is the disorder happens because we imitate our parents, we imitate others, we imitate sinners. It's bad example which gets handed down. It's not by inheritance. How can one man inherit another man's sin after all? It's not possible. And so likewise, so it, it's, it's an imitation. The moral evil is imitation. And so consequently... There, it's, it's not a consequence of sin precisely and the uh, death and suffering is, is not a punishment it's just a natural condition of man it's not a punishment for sin they said and likewise baptism was not that which takes away removes original sin but a sign of admission to the church rather familiar isn't it Yes, nothing is new under the sun and the era of the modernists concerning baptism is exactly that of Pelagianism from the 5th century. Namely, that its original sin is not a stain to our soul. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's not something in our soul and consequently doesn't have to be removed by a sacrament. That was in the early centuries the time of the Protestant Reformation, as you know, was the next time in which the church's teaching concerning original sin was disputed. And we find from the Protestants, in fact, two opposing errors which are presented. And it's, it's a rather strange paradox. But we have two opposing errors by Protestants concerning original sin. It's typical of the the inconsistency, incoherency of Protestantism. And so then there are the liberal Protestants who minimize or attenuate original sin and the effects of original sin, saying that it doesn't really do anything to us, that it's, it's not important, and consequently they deny the necessity of grace and leads to naturalism liberal Protestantism. Then at the other extreme we have the original Protestants Luther and Kelvin who in this are in agreement with the Jansenists, another heresy, heresy of the 17th century and 18th century and what Luther and Kelvin and the Jansenists did was to exaggerate 
original sin beyond measure in saying that it was something that wholly corrupted human nature, which destroyed human nature, which made human nature incapable of doing any good whatsoever. Man's nature is totally corrupt, totally destroyed, said Luther, Calvin, and the Jansenists. And consequently, they destroyed, by their theory, free will. Man is no longer free. If his nature is destroyed, he can't serve God. He's not free to do so. He can't do anything good anymore. No point in trying. And that's what Luther and Calvin said. And that likewise, of course, destroyed the reality of sanctifying grace. We're going to see the, the answer to some of those errors in a second. First of all, I'd like to touch on the basis of of the teaching on original sin in sacred scripture and I'll just mention two passages the first passage in sacred scripture is from the Old Testament it's from the Miserere Psalm 50 in which we profess to Almighty God our sinfulness and one part of that Miserere is the profession of our inborn sinfulness the sinfulness that we have from the moment of the, our conception in our mother's womb. That's verse 7 of Psalm 50. Behold, I was conceived in iniquities and in sins did my mother conceive me. Not born in, but conceived in. The very origin of my life is in iniquities. Very explicit text. There is no other explanation, but there is some evil, guilt, sin in my soul in the moment in which I was conceived. In the New Testament, the text which is very explicit is in St. Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 5, and in which he develops the whole question of original sin. He develops it, though, in comparison with the redemption, so as to highlight the mystery of the redemption, just as by one man's sin entered into this world and through sin death so likewise through one man our Lord Jesus Christ the second Adam so life entered into this world and the resurrection everlasting life so there's a direct parallel between the first Adam and the second Adam which St. Paul develops in this chapter 5 of his letter to the Romans and he points out precisely that it's by one man sin entered this world and death, so death passed unto all men because all have sinned, or in that all have sinned. And so, by stating that all have sinned, he's talking about a sin which has come down from Adam. And later on in that same chapter, verse 19, he points out that by the disobedience of one man, that many were made sinners through the disobedience of Adam that many were made sinners let's not answer the question right now how it can be that we're sinners through somebody else's fault how can that be we'll get to that but right now the fact in divine revelation is that we are made sinners because of the sin of our first father Adam obviously we're not talking about a personal guilt. It's not my sin, original sin. We're talking about a guilt which is inherited. And you might say, how can a guilt be inherited? How can the sins of parents be passed on to, the, to, to children? Personal guilt cannot be. It's true. But we'll see in what sense guilt can be later on when we talk about the nature of original sin. These passages... There are other passages, but these are the most explicit passages. Have always been interpreted by the church and the church's fathers as meaning original sin. This doctrine was developed especially in the fourth century, in the fathers of the fourth century, such as St. Augustine, St. John Chrysostom, St. Ambrose. And it is combined in establishing the doctrine of original sin with the universal practice of baptism of infants because 
if there were not such a thing as the bat as universe as sorry as original sin if there were not such a thing as original sin the baptism of infants would make no sense there's no sense in making them belong to a community they don't have any the use of their free will or their intellect at this time there's no point giving them virtues they can't use virtues if the reason why infant baptism was universally practiced in the in the early church was to remove sin original sin from their souls and faint saint in fact saint cyprian states it very explicitly <coughs> that the baptism of infants is administered in remissionem peccatorum for the remission of sins as do the other fathers and so baptism infant baptism as a universal practice not just sometimes or some places but absolutely universal in the early church is a clear witness to the belief of the existence of some evil some sin some corruption which needed to be removed which is what we know as the sin of origin Adam's sin let's say then a few words about the nature of original sin what is it first of all it's it's a lot easier to say what it is not and if we say first of all what it is not we'll come to a better idea of what it is and so we can exclude three things which original sin is not so let's have a better understanding of what it is it is not a punishment it would be reasonable that God would have punished Adam and punished all of us because we're together with Adam. But that's not what original sin is. And there was a theologian in the 12th century by the name of Abelard who said that he was condemned. Because if, it's just, if original sin was just a punishment due to Adam's sin, then it's not a true and proper sin at all. But then we would not have all those sins in Adam scripture would not be true, we would not be conceived in iniquity. It's not a punishment because it's got to be a true and proper sin. And that's defined by the Council of Trent in Canon 5. If anyone asserts that by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is confirmed in baptism, um, that that which has the true and proper nature of sin is not taken away let him be anathema so anybody says that the true and proper nature of sin is not taken away by baptism then he's condemned by the church anybody says about a punishment of sin is condemned by the church it's truly a guilt that's what sin is the punishment is something extra added over and above but the sin itself is the guilt so it's a guilt Hmm. let's leave the explanation for a second but the church's teaching is that it's a guilt it's a true and proper sin second error which is to be excluded that original sin is not it is not concupiscence that habitual concupiscence which exists in our flesh it was Luther and Kelvin and the Jansons likewise who maintained following St. Augustine who was somewhat misinterpreted on this point that original sin is concupiscence the desire for pleasure um, problem with that is that concupiscence remains after baptism and so consequently if you say that original sin is concupiscence then it remains after baptism the other problem is concupiscence is not necessarily a sin it's a tendency towards a sin it's a, a disordered desire but it, it, it's only a sin if it's consented to it's not a sin necessarily at all that is not what original sin is because it's a true sin it's an effect of original sin if you like the fact that we still have concupiscence even after con original sin is removed but it's not original sin that is defined by the council of trent likewise in canon 5 this holy synod confesses and perceives that there remains in the baptized concupiscence of an inclination although this is left to be wrestled with 
it cannot harm those who do not consent but who manfully resist. This concupiscence, which sometimes St. Paul the Apostle calls sin, the Holy Synod declares that the Catholic Church has never understood to be called sin as truly and properly sin in those born again. But it is because it is from sin and inclines to sin. So that when we, St. Paul in, in, in the first letter uh, to the, uh, no, sorry, in, in the epistle to the Romans, calls concupiscence sometimes sin. But it's uh, not exact meaning of the word, it's an inclination to sin. It's not pro truly and properly sin. Original sin is not a disorder which remains after baptism, it's not concupiscence. It's, because that's not really sin at all. It's something much, much more deeply rooted in the soul than even concupiscence. Third thing which original sin is not, it's not as if Adam's sin was said to belong to us. Why it's called imputation. Well, it's, it's Adam's sin, but it's said to belong to <coughs> all of us. Imputation, an outward imputation of Adam's sin. There was a theory that said that, well, it's people say that it's Adam's sin, they say it belongs to you, therefore it's yours. It's the imputation which is transmitted. But really, with only Adam's sin, it's not your sin at all. It's not our sin, it's just Adam's sin which kind of said, is spoken of as belonging to us. But if that were the case, we would not inherit original sin. We would only inherit the punishment, or as if we had committed it, but we would not have be in any way responsible, there would be no way guilt for that sin. And that theory is also condemned by the Council of Trent, which says that it's not an external uh, imputation, but it's truly a sin in us. Um, and if, in fact, it was just an outward thing, it would not, we would not need baptism. We would not need to have something eradicated from our soul. But you see, that's what baptism does. It eradicates original sin. It remits original sin. It's not just something which is said about us. It really is in us. And so consequently, the removal of original sin is an eradication of some a disorder which is in a true and proper way sin which touches our very person, as is declared by the Council of Trent. Okay, so we said what it's not. It's not a punishment due to sin, it's not concupiscence, and it's not being said as if it belongs to us, external imputation. What is it then? What is a reason? What can it be? How can it be a sin then in us? The principle to resolve this whole question concerning original sin is one which is very little understood in our individualistic age in which we live. But it's a principle which sees us as members of mankind, the human race, and Adam as the head of the human race. And Adam was created to be the head of all mankind. He was created as the first man. He was given sanctifying grace and he was created responsible for all of us as a true father of mankind, a true representative of mankind, the true head of mankind. And consequently what he did, he did as head, responsible, father for all of mankind whether it was for good whether it was for bad and so consequently we are all united in Adam through our common human nature and even when Adam was created he was created not in the order of pure nature because such a thing never existed but he was created in the supernatural order with grace as head 
of the human race in the supernatural order as well as in the natural order. He had to, 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 to direct all of us. And so consequently, when Adam sinned, he sinned as head of the whole human race, supernatural head. And so he lost grace not just for himself as an individual, but for the whole of the human race, of which he was the head and the representative. When he rebelled and refused obedience to Almighty God, he did it as head of all of mankind, so that through his rebellion, all mankind refused obedience to God. And we are all one with Adam in his rebellion as we were one with him in his creation in a state of sanctifying grace and so consequently when Adam sinned we truly every one of us participated in that sin and we are in a real and proper manner sinners which is why we inherit from Adam the absence of grace which constitutes original sin the absence of grace and also secondarily concupiscence the disorder of our passions and it's because of our dependence upon Adam that we inherited he was our head we depend upon him in God's plan in the supernatural order this mystery of the unity of mankind <coughs> in Adam our first head is is best understood by us by comparison with the mystery of the church the mystical body of Christ and, 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 and if we have some difficulty understanding it we just need to think about the church and we see how our Lord Jesus Christ is head of all redeemed mankind head of all the members of the church he directs and governs the church he pours grace into the members of the church he is the one who administers the sacraments in the church. He's the principal priest. Everything comes directly from our divine Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ in the church. And there's nothing that doesn't come from him. Everything comes from him. He's the head where the members were incorporated into him. We're part of his body. That's incorporated means a part of his body, a part of Christ. And so consequently, we totally depend upon Christ for the life of grace, for our supernatural life. Well, was it any different with Adam? And Christ is the second Adam. It was no different with the first Adam. It was the supernatural order, yes. It was not the redemption. There didn't have to be a redemption at that time. Because it was before sin, which was the reason for the redemption. But Adam was just as really the supernatural head of the human race as Christ is the supernatural head of the church. And so consequently, when he failed and rebelled, we all failed and rebelled. And we inherit that rebellion because we're in, in solidarity with him, one with him, in that rebellion. That's the principle by which we can begin to understand this mystery of original sin and it'll help us to understand and to say exactly what <coughs> original sin is okay what is it so we've accepted that we have sinned together with adam we inherit that sin but what is original sin i mean it's not a personal sin it's not something i did Personally, it's not my personal guilt. It's a fault that I've inherited. It's a fault of Adam, which is common to all of mankind. But what is it? It is the loss, as we know, of original justice. Adam lost the state of sanctifying grace for himself and for all of mankind. But it's more than just the loss. It's a culpable loss. And in Adam, we share in Adam, who is the head and where his members, the culpable loss of sanctifying grace. 
And that culpability is not something personal to me. That culpability is because I am in union with my head who is Adam. As a man, as a human creature, I'm united with my head who is Adam. And so consequently, original sin is the loss of sanctifying grace which I am responsible for because of my union with Adam. It's a death of the soul which we all share. And it's, it's the eradication of sanctifying grace from all of the souls of all mankind by that one act on behalf of all of mankind in which I share because I'm a member of mankind. And so it's a, it's, it's a guilt, a sin which is not personal but which is of our nature. It's a guilt which belongs to our human nature. It's not a personal sin. That's the difference which we need to understand if we're going to understand how it can be a true and proper sin and still exist in us. So consequently, we can truly talk about the guilt of original sin and, yes Michael? Did you say uh, original sin in the last of the contract is because of our union with Adam? It's because of our union with Adam that we lost sanctifying grace and the guilt and the culpability is our oneness with Adam who, who, who lost grace on behalf of all of mankind. So it's a guilt of nature, not a personal fault. But God, when he created mankind, he created us one. And when he gave Adam the state of original justice, the sanctifying grace, he gave it to him for all of mankind. So that we would all share that state. And so consequently, God could not change what he had created. He could not make that only Adam would get the sin. Because Adam was the representative and head of all of mankind. That was how God had created him and established him. So God could not change the fact that once Adam had sinned, we all would inherit the sin. It's in the very nature of things. Could not be any other way. That's how God had made us as one mankind. Now God could have done things differently. It's true. He could have made us as if we're not one mankind, as if we're not united together. We don't share one nature. He, so that we weren't engendered from Adam and not descended from Adam. He could have, made, he could have done things all in any different way. But ultimately, the reason why he permitted this way was that he wanted Adam and Adam's fall to be the means for which the redemption took place, the second Adam, which brought much greater grace than the first Adam had lost. So we can only make sense of original sin in view of the incarnation and the redemption of our divine Savior, the second Adam, in whom we are united much more profoundly even than in Adam throughout human nature. And so we can't say why God didn't have to do it this way. It's true he did not. He chose to do it this way for a much greater good. Does that answer the question? Yes, Byron? With Adam, so did Adam know his role as the head of the whole universe? And did he know the consequences? Adam, yes, he did know his role because he had infused knowledge. God had given him the knowledge for all of his roles. He knew he was the first man. He knew that he was the one who was representing all of mankind. He knew that his sin of rebellion would be a sin which would be shared by all of his descendants. He had to know that. And, you know, he did not know how many descendants he would have. He did not know if God would live leave him on this earth or kill him maybe he didn't but he knew if he had descendants he was the man the first man given this pure perfect state given this test on behalf of his whole race and descendants and so and of course then we see the gravity of the sin that adam committed in full knowledge and full awareness not just out of a passing passion and so uh, there is a there is a, a, a guilt and a voluntariness that is transmitted to us through original sin. It's not that of a personal voluntariness, but it's a, a voluntariness in Adam. And 
not that of actual sin. We tend to think of only actual sin, and that's why we can't understand original sin. But there is a true voluntariness in Adam, and that voluntariness is what produces our turning away from God. We are all, when we are born, until we receive sanctifying grace, voluntarily turned away from God. Not by a personal will, but by the will of our nature, which we share from Adam. And it's a turning away from God, which separates us from God which is in our will, it's the way our will is distorted from the very moment in which we are conceived, our will is distorted and turned away from God. Our will shares that voluntarily from Adam, not by our own will, because we're not able to have a will yet, but in our oneness with Adam. And um, and so consequently, uh, it's, uh, it's in respect to Adam's will that our willfulness and our guilt exists, not our own will. There was a, 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 another error, see, another error, sorry, condemned by the church, the error of Bayus, who said that original sin was due to our own personal will. Well, that's false, and that was condemned by the church. No, it's not our own personal will. It's the will of Adam with which we are all united by being members of the human race, in which we share and that's what constitutes the guilt and the culpability of original sin. Now, the theologians make a distinction when talking about original sin. They talk about what it consists in formally, and what it consists in formally is what really makes up original sin, what determines it, what, what distinguishes original sin. And they distinguish what makes it up formally from that which it is materially. Formally, what really makes original sin original sin is the loss or privation of original justice which turns our wills from God, produces that aversion to God, that rebellion against God that we all share in. That's what really original sin is. Then, as St. Thomas Aquinas explains, materially which is what we see, what we observe, what we feel. It's secondary. It's a complementary thing. It comes as a consequence of that which is essential to original sin. And what we, what we feel as a consequence, what, what original sin is materially, is the disorder of our unregulated concupiscence our concupiscences, our evil desires, our selfishness, our desire that is motivated by pure passion. That's concupiscence. That's what we feel. It's a consequence of original sin. It's not what it truly is formally. It's but a consequence. Because we can feel that and yet not concede to it, give way to it. It's not in itself a sin. Whereas original sin is a sin. It's that loss of sanctifying grace from which comes the evil desires the turning towards creatures the tendency towards sin which we uh, which we feel so acutely in our soul without a doubt and the consequences of original sin on our soul are the effect then which is felt and the church churches teach on those consequences of original sin um, it's very explicit also. There are some, as we mentioned, Luther and Kelvin, who said that that concupiscence totally has destroyed human nature. So that we are not capable of any good. We can't do any merit-worthy acts whatsoever. And that's condemned by the church. It's not true. What we lost <coughs> is the supernatural gifts of God. And the church determines it is, and is defined that our natural capacities are intact. It's true that they're weakened, they're wounded. We are wounded by the removal of the order of our will by grace to Almighty God. We're wounded in our abilities, but we're not deprived of our natural abilities. It's only the supernatural that we're lost, that we've been deprived of. But that wounding 
which is what we, we feel when we feel concupiscence. We feel that wounding. And that wounding is what makes us feel totally defenseless against the world, the flesh and the devil, the enemies. And you know, if, we did, if, if the world, the flesh and the devil didn't have a collaborator inside of us, we wouldn't fear them at all. But they do. It's our concupiscence. But that's not what original sin is, it's a consequence. And that does not totally corrupt our human nature. So we still can resist temptation, perform good deeds. Of course, we need God's grace to do that. Also, what we're particularly aware of is that even when original sin has been removed by baptism, by sanctifying grace, we still have concupiscence disorder and we still have the the um, the loss of the preternatural gifts impassibility immortality knowledge and integrity the four impass the, the four preternatural gifts that I mentioned they're lost and they're lost forever and, and that that's not what original sin is but it's a consequence of original sin that we experience if you like that's a punishment and it's a punishment which is due to the fact that the free gifts of God were lost by our first parent, Adam. Next question which we need to consider is how original sin is passed down. And if, it, you know, if we have sin from Adam, how do we receive sin from Adam? You know? How can we receive sin from, from, from somebody else? Again, the principle is that we are one with Adam as members of the human race. He is the head of the human race. So what unites us as members of the human race is what is going consequently to be the means for us to receive original sin. What unites us then? What unites us is the fact that we're all descended from Adam. It's the act of generation. The act of generation in the natural order unites all of mankind. Unites parents, children to their parents, and, go, and so on. And so it's consequently by the act of natural generation that original sin is passed down. We've got to understand that it's not a, you know, it's not that the act of generation is a sinful thing. Of course, it's not. It's a blessed and holy thing created by God. You might say, well, how can something which is good in itself hand down evil? And so we have to understand that what is being handed down is not a personal sin, but a state of sin, a habitual thing. <coughs> it doesn't depend upon the will of the individual either a person who hands down original sin to his children or anybody else for that matter. It depends upon our unity with the supernatural head of mankind, which is Adam. And it's, 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 common, it, it, it's a state of sin, it's a sin of our, of our human race, which is handed down, not personal culpability. And, um, and that's also defined by the Council of Trent in Canon 3 which points out that it's of faith that we inherit original sin by generation. That there may be washed away by regeneration what we contracted by generation. Regeneration is by grace, by the redemption. is washed away what we contracted by generation. So it's by natural generation. It's of faith. And, and we can see in that way that original sin is one. There's only one original sin for all of mankind. It's not as if all of us have different original sins. No, it's one. which is handed down. It's absolutely one. It's a sin of nature. It's a sin of our origin, which is transmitted in exactly the same way as human nature is transmitted and handed down. And what that means is that our human nature is handed down in a state or way of existence as necessarily deprived of sanctifying grace, disordered from God, having had that disorder, 
and hence being overwhelmed by concupiscence and of course with the loss of the preternatural gifts that's the state in which human nature is handed down that's and that's what we call original sin but it's one it's only one original sin which we all share in and so we can say that the cause of original sin the principal cause the one that really began it all is the sin of Adam he's personally responsible but also we could say that the act of generation is the also a cause of original sin because it's how each one of us received original sin is when we we're engendered by our parents when we we're conceived by our parents and so we say that that is the instrumental cause it's the means by which we have that solidarity by with adam is that we were conceived by our parents and so consequently that natural act of generation by our parents is the instrument by which original sin comes down to us just like baptism is the instrument by which we receive sanctifying grace from the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ and the newness of life so through our parents active generation of us we receive original sin it's important to know that pleasure or concupiscence has got nothing to do with it and it's irrelevant whether that act of generation was a sin or not it can be perfectly good and, and, and honest and upright and still it conveys it hands down original sin and the pleasure and all the rest of it is not a part of original sin whatsoever it's got nothing to do with it it's simply the means by which we are all one with Adam there was an objection which we have to respond to on this regard which says that if original sin comes to us in that manner by our human nature which God created the God is the, is the originator of original sin since he created us since he made us and he and he's the one who created the way which we would be engendered therefore he's the one who's responsible for original sin And the answer to that objection is that God is not to be blamed either for the fault of Adam or for our unity with Adam, our solidarity with Adam. Because that's something which is unavoidable with the way he previously created us with free will. And so consequently it's not God who is the originator of original sin, but all of us in Adam. It's our human nature in Adam, and hence all of us. Him as by a personal sin, the rest of us, that same sin is a sin of origin, a sin of nature. And so consequently, the fact that the act of generation transmits original sin is not God. He didn't establish that. He didn't make that happen. We made that happen. Adam made that happen. So the fact that, that we or the parents hand down original sin to their children is not God's fault. It's man's fault. It's Adam's fault. And we're united, each one of us, to Adam. There's consequently nothing unjust whatsoever about original sin. Nothing unjust about us sharing in Adam's original sin whatsoever. Nothing unjust about our deprivation of sanctifying grace. Nothing unjust even about the disorder of concupiscence that we have to fight with for the rest of our lives. That could have been avoided if Adam and we in Adam had not been a part of original sin. Of course, we can't explain away the mystery. Original sin remains a mystery. Of course it's a mystery. Just like the, the Catholic Church, the mystical body of Christ is a mystery. You can't explain away that mystery. And we must know, we explain what we can and we, we admire and adore the rest. And even when it's a mystery of evil as his original sin, we can see how it fits into God's plan of providence. And I'd like to quote for you a uh, just a little passage here from Archbishop Lefebvre's <coughs> book on his spiritual journey in which he points that out. He points out, of course, why 
God permitted the sin of our first parents. You know? And all of its horrifying consequences. And we can only understand the mystery of original sin when we understand why. Certainly God provided our first parents with all the means to obtain this marvelous end by observing the laws imposed by him. But under the influence of Satan, Eve disobeyed the law of God and led Adam into his horrible sin, which was to have stupefying consequences, namely the disorder in his descendants, then all the history of humanity. But stupefying also was the manifestation of the mercy of God provoked by this fault. God going to his death on the cross in the person of the Word, who put on this sinful flesh in order to make for himself a family of elect, members of his mystical body and purified in his precious blood. If that had not been original sin, and if we had not all been solidari solidary, one in Adam, there could not have been the redemption, nor the mystery of the church, nor the sacraments, None of that would have had any purpose. And if God permitted the mystery of evil and our oneness in, in, in Adam, it was in order to prepare the path for the redemption and our oneness in Christ. So much greater, so much more magnificent in which man finds his true purpose for which he was made to, to praise, love and serve God. So are there any questions? Yes, Mr. Jobs says. Not quite a question, though. No, it's uh, just an observation to me. In case we are come from Holland and the surrounding countries, we call it not original sin, we call it heritage, which means inherited. 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 Sin. Mm -hmm. uh, the English. Right, it's true that uh, another term, as in Dutch, is inherited sin. Original sin is by its very nature inherited. And it, 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 and that's, of course, the defined doctrine of the church. And it's, it's a, another expression to say the same thing, isn't it? Original, from our origin, means inherited. But most people don't understand what original really means from our origin, which means inherited from Adam, necessarily. Couldn't be anything but that. So it means the same thing. And that's good to point that out. Fine. If you like, we'll finish with a prayer. We hope that you enjoyed this video. Please don't forget to subscribe, like and share.